Happy Sabbath Church. We thank God for his mercies that uh, once again we are here this morning to worship him. Thank you, brother, for the special song, too. Um, for those who do not know me properly, I, 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 uh, even including those who, who knew me already, uh, I just want to remind you again, once again, that uh, you, you need to be attentive for the sake of my accent and my English. It's not American. So please be attentive. Um, our friend, my brother John Paul, already read the, the, the main text, the key text, which I would, I would want to read again. From 1 Kings chapter 18, verses 17 to 21. My Bible is New King James Version. <laughs> and it reads as follows. Then it happened when Ahab saw Elijah, that Ahab said to him, Is that you, O troubler of Israel? And he answered, I have not troubled Israel, but you and your father's house have, in that you have forsaken the commandments of the Lord and have followed the bows. Now, therefore, send and gather all Israel to me on Mount Carmel, the 450 prophets of Baal and the 400 prophets of Asherah who eat at Jezebel's table. So Ahab sent for all the children of Israel and gathered the prophets together on Mount Carmel. And Elijah came to all the people and said, How long will you falter between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal, follow him. But the people answered him not a word. Based on this passage, I decided to entitle our sermon this morning as Be Fully Decided. Be Fully Decided. Shall we ask our Father in heaven for guidance? Our God and our Savior in heaven. Lord, our minds are carnal. We cannot grasp your word unless you guide us. Help us, Lord, to understand the inspired word that came all the way from heaven, written in the scriptures for us, and help us to live according to it. In the name and blood of Jesus we pray. Amen. It is very illogical in this world for Someone who understands that he needs a savior. Someone who understands that he needs salvation. And that his life or her life is supposed to be, to be entrusted to Jesus for salvation. And yet failing to decide fully to live for that savior. It so happened in Israel... As we know, Israel was a chosen nation by God. It was special to God. Because he chose it so that uh, his name would be glorified throughout the world. That, the, that all the nations in this world would be able to, to know the true God who created them and who sustains them. And so... God sent messages a lot of times to Israel. He raised prophets in Israel in order to guide the nation. 
So a lot of times the Israelites backslided, but God uh, um, performed miracles that would help them to, to be revived and, and come back to him again. Now, during this time of Elijah, the nation of Israel, which should have been united into one nation, as the whole nation saving God, at one time during the, the, the reign of Solomon, when we read from 1 Kings chapter 11, verses 9, 9 to 13, we find that Solomon had backslided and turned to idols. So God was angered a lot, and he decided that he, he would reign the nation. And so he also said that he, the, that would not be done during the time of, of, of Solomon, but afterward. And so it came uh, to happen that uh, after his death, during the reign of his, of his uh, son, Rehoboam, the, the nation of Israel was divided into the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. At that time, Jeroboam, who, who had been given the northern kingdom, found grace in the eyes of God. But then, after being given the kingdom to, to lead it, he also backslided and, and caused the children of Israel to start worshipping idols. And so even those who followed Jeroboam did the same. Now, the, the father of Ahab, King Ahab, Omri, had also done exceedingly, exceedingly evil, exceedingly sinful in the sight of God. And then after him, his son Ahab, came onto the throne and became the, the king of, of the northern kingdom of Israel. But then we are told when we read from 1 Kings chapter 16 verses 30 to 33. 1 Kings chapter 16 verses 30 to 33. It says, now Ahab, the son of Omri, did evil in the sight of the Lord more than all who were before him. And it came to pass Okay, I'm there. And it came to pass as though it had been a trivial thing for him to walk in the, in the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, that he took as, uh, as wife Jezebel, the daughter of Ethbal, king of the Sidonians. And he went and saved Baal and worshipped him. Then he set an altar for Baal in the temple of Baal, which he had built in Samaria. And Ahab made a wooden image. Ahab did more to provoke the Lord God of Israel to anger than all the kings of Israel who were before him. Just before this, this time in history, the children of Israel pledged to follow God all the way. Several times in the Bible we find them being questioned that uh, would you be able to follow your creator? Then they would answer to say, whatever the Lord says, we will do. But then, someone comes to the throne. A king who should have understood that he was made king by the, by, by the God of heaven, decides to bring in idol worship. He decides to, to marry Jezebel, a princess, a, a heathen princess. And then he even built a temple for Baal and set an altar for Baal 
and did all kinds of other evils in the sight of God. And yet we are told from Deuteronomy chapter 7 verses 3 to 5. The Israelites were told clearly not to intermarry with non-believers. They were told not to worship the gods of the surrounding nations. But he ignored all this, just like the other kings who had come before him, and even exceeded the, the worship of Baal. And so, this is a great lesson that comes to us also in our, in our time. Just like the Israelites did, they forgot to follow the, the plain instructions of the Lord, their Creator. A lot of times, as Adventists also, we know very well that we are God's special church. Yet we tend to ignore, we turn blind eyes on, on plain instructions of the, uh, of, of the Lord. You know, just like, for example, Ahab had done, we intermarry with non-believers. We bring in strange doctrines. As such, because of so doing, we find ourselves worshiping strange gods before strange altars. But then, the thing is that by the grace of God, every time when, the, the, when there was national apostasy, God would have a remnant who remained loyal to him. And so even during this time, we find Elijah is one of those who had remained loyal to him. One of those who were, who were uh, distressed by the strange worship, um, uh, the, the strange manner of worship in the nation of Israel. And so God gave him a message, a message to convey to the nation of Israel so that his children may turn back to him. So we find in chapter 17, verse 1, it says that um, we are told that Elijah went, was sent to, to Ahab, the king. And so when he went there, he conveyed the message that God had given him. That because of the backsliding of the nation that was led by King Ahab, there would be drought throughout the land. You know, it's... Uh, It is something that uh, brings great concern to me. To find a nation that had been chosen by God, a, no a, a nation that, that had pledged to remain loyal to him, departing from God so greatly. You know, the Israelites, when they arrived in Israel, in, in, in Canaan, they had told Samuel that they would want to live like the, the, the heathen nations to have a king. And so, throughout their lifetime, that kind of principle of living like the surrounding nations was sustained by the enemy through their lives. And so it is for that reason that at this stage we find the nation had, had turned against God like that in a great measure. And so Elijah pronounced a drought. And then after that, immediately after proclaiming the message, then he went his way. So there was a great drought in Israel for three and a half years. 
We are told from 1 Kings chapter 18, verse 2. It says that there was a severe famine in Israel. And so, imagine, imagine a drought that, uh, that, that would be experienced for three and a half years. It was very, very severe. When the Bible says severe, it's, it's real. And so, Elijah went his way, but then the message of the uh, um, of doom that uh, that Elijah had, had had proclaimed went throughout the land, and this should have helped the nation to search themselves and turn back to God. But then we find that they did not do so. So. God was greatly displeased by our, our friends in Israel. Just like most of the time us as a spiritual Israel keep on displeasing God. So when we read from 1 Kings chapter 18 verses 17 to 21. We see toward the end of this drought period, God had again come to, to Elijah and he told him to go and, and uh, present himself before Ahab. And he did so. Now, just before that time, just before that time, we find during the time of the drought, during the, this time when the drought was, was severe and Elijah had gone away into hiding according to God's guidance, that uh, Jezebel, the, the princess, decided to kill all those who worshipped the true God. But then, good enough, Obadiah, the servant of Ahab, had hid, hid some, of the, some of the prophets of God in two caves. And now, the time had come that Elijah should go and present himself before Ahab again. During his, his absentia, Ahab had sent people throughout the surrounding nations to search for, for Elijah so that when he was found, he should be killed. But then the time had come that Ahab should go and pre present himself before, that Elijah should, come, uh, should go and present himself before Ahab again. So we read from chapter 18, verses 17 to 21 that we already read. In verse 17, Ahab said that, Is that you, O traveler of Israel? You see, Israel was a special nation. They enjoyed a lot of blessings of God. But then, when, God, when, when, when they turned against God, God would withdraw some of those blessings that they enjoyed. Just because of their own evils, because of their own sin. But during the time of this drought, Ahab had not repented. He had not had time to search his own soul. Instead, instead of searching himself, he searched for Elijah. Elijah had no power, you know, to, to inflict such kind of pain upon the nation. Elijah in him was no power 
to bring about drought in the nation. But God had. So instead of turning to God, he turned against Elijah. Instead of searching himself, he searched for Elijah. Elijah had simply been used by God in order to convey the message from him to the, to, to the people. And so we see, we see shift, uh, uh, blame shifting here. Even during our time, throughout history, you find that those who refuse to receive reproof and to be corrected always manifest enmity, malice, and hatred against those whom God uses as channels of, of, of his message. The people want to live the way they want. When God reproves them, then, instead of humbling themselves, they turn against those whom God has used. And so, during this time, Ahab said, are you the troubler of Israel? When Elijah never introduced any kind of strange worship, strange manner of worship. So Ahab had all the time to make things right with God. After three and a half years of that famine, Imagine a period of three and a half years. Ahab had not had time to search himself. Ahab had not repented in any way. Ahab had never asked the people to find out what had gone wrong in the truthful manner. But the moment he saw Elijah, he said, Oh, are you the troubler of Israel? It happens during our time as well. When some people are given spiritual advice, their attitude becomes that of hatred against those who advise them. When some people, you know, are corrected, then they turn against those who, who want them to make such kind of corrections. As though salvation comes from those people when it comes from the, 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 the throne of God. It comes from God himself. And so we need to live as channels of blessings to the world. No matter how much the world may hate us. As individual members of the church, we need to, to yearn for that, for that spirit of Elijah. As members of the Lord's Church, from time to time we need to learn how to search our souls and make things right with God. But then we find Elijah giving him a correct answer. Elijah said, I have not troubled Israel, but you and your father's house have in that you have forsaken the commandments of the Lord and have followed vows. You know, when, when, we, when we receive a negative attitude from others, those whom we would love to see doing the right, the right things in the name of Jesus, when we, when we receive hostility or hatred, we should not get discouraged. But we should go ahead with what the word of God says. And so Elijah told him clearly that you, have, you are the one who has brought trouble in Israel because you have forsaken the commandments of God and followed Baal. When we see the church members doing things that are not right, there's that kind of tendency of saying, ah, it's okay, okay, let them go ahead. Uh, maybe if I say like this, they may feel hurt. Oh, the message that we follow is from the throne of God. 
You know, and we should uh, have the desire to see that everyone follows it the right way according to the instructions and guidelines of God from, from above. And so when we tend to, to give such kind of correction to others, using the very divine guidelines, we are right. But then when we turn a deaf eye, uh, a deaf ear, or a blind eye upon others, we as well become partakers of such kind of, 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 of uh, errors that others, uh, others commit. And so we cannot find grace in the sight of God. Now we are told at this stage that uh, Baal had 450 prophets. And the 400 prophets were for Asherah. Baal was, was an idol that was worshipped by the surrounding nations. The, the heathen believed that uh, the, there was a male god who was responsible for sustaining the, the vegetation, the rain, and the dew that they enjoyed. That's the way they took it. And so they worshipped this, this male god, uh, god by the name of Baal. And Asherah was also a similar god who was female. The heathen nations believed that Asherah was the one, you know, who helped them to, to have good produce, you know, and that uh, both of these gods are the ones who brought about the rains that they enjoyed, and, uh, everything, the vegetation, the, the good trees that they saw, the grass, it were because of these, these idols. And so the, the heathen, who did not have the knowledge of the true God, worshipped such. And we cannot blame them. But God had a purpose that when Israel was, 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 uh, was uh, centered there in Canaan, even the surrounding nations would, uh, would have a clear knowledge of the Creator. But now, instead that the instruments of salvation that God had, had chosen in, uh, in the name of Israel, and said that they should continue saving the creator of heaven so that the heathen tribes would, would learn from them, they instead are the ones who turned to the heathen gods. And so this gives me great concern without reserve, that in Israel, a nation that had been chosen by God should be found 450 prophets of Baal. It is something unbelievable. And yet it is truthful that in Israel, the people before whom or among whom God performed a lot of wonders so that their faith in God would not waver, we find 400 prophets of Asherah. And so... We, we find Elijah now asking them or uh, um, pronouncing this kind of exclamation. Now imagine it's because of such beliefs that God the Creator decided that there should, that there should be drought so that when this drought would be experienced in the nation, if people would now come back to their senses and reason rightly that no, the one who is responsible for the rain we've had and the vegetation are not Baal and Asherah, but God the Creator. Now, even after four, I mean, after three and a half years, when Elijah gathered all the people to Mount Carmel, we still find these prophets of Baal and Asherah in Israel. By that time, all these prophets should have, should have turned back to God. After three and a half years, no, they, they should have reasoned that, no, no, no. This nation is the nation that, that has been worshipping the true God alone. Because the knowledge of the true God had not faded in the people. No, it had not faded. 
They still believed they, they were a special nation. But instead of just remaining loyal, by doing only those, those things that the God of heaven had commanded them to do, they brought in strange manner of worship. And so on Mount Carmel, now Elijah exclaims to say, how long will you falter between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal, then follow him. But the people answered him not a word, says the Bible. Elijah asked them. He said, there's a great problem here. In other words, he says there's a great problem in the nation. That the nation, the majority of the nation's inhabitants, have a double standard manner of worship. Instead of only clinging to uh, to, the, to the God of heaven, they also worshipped idols. And so he says, no, that's not good. We need, everyone needs to make a, a, a clear decision. Everyone should become fully decided. If you want to remain a worshipper of the true God, then do so. If you want to to, to do away with the creator of heavens, okay, then go ahead. So the same question Jesus asked us this morning. Jesus poses us a similar question today because he sees a double standard of godliness among his people. That the Seventh-day Adventist Church, which, was, uh, which has been guided and was organized by him and him alone, finds itself with members of double standard. People, instead of remaining loyal to God, yes, by mouth they, they acknowledge that they are worshippers of God, but indeed they do not reflect that kind of real faith of clinging really upon the God of heaven. So Jesus says, how long will you falter in between two opinions? If you think you are wasting your time worshipping the creator, then it would be good to do everything that the heathen do. To become fully a worshipper of the of the of, of the heathen gods, but then if you see that is it is worthy for you to remain on the side of Jesus, then you better fully decide to follow Him in every aspect. And so uh, Elijah asked to um, to be given two bulls. One for him, and one for the prophets of Baal and the Asherah. And so he said, cut them, kill them, and cut them into pieces, and then put them on. He said, choose yours. No, when the, when the two bulls were, were, were brought, he told the worshippers of Baal to select theirs. Because had he selected first, there could have been a lot of excuses. But then he said, okay, do your selection first. And so they got one, they killed it, cut it into pieces, and put it on, on the altar of Baal, which was right on Mount Carmel. You know, on those mountains and hills in the nation, those mountains had, had become the center of worship. And especially idol worship. They had become the center of idol worship, including Mount Carmel itself. And so there was already an altar that was already erected there for the worship of Baal. And so he said, okay, get one bull, cut it in, into pieces, and put the pieces on your altar, and you pray to Baal to answer by fire. So the God who answers by fire, that is the one who, who is supposed to be followed could be acknowledged as a, a true God. And so they did so. Now, sadly enough, when we read from verse 26, 
When they started praying and prophesying, the worshippers of Baal said, Oh, Baal, hear us. It's unbelievable that such a thing could be done that the Israelites could sink so low to reach such kind of an extent of, of even you know, shouting unto Baal. Baal was simply, simply man-made idols. Structures which could not move. Structures which never, never said anything. But uh, there they were. They said, oh Baal, hear us. And we are told from verse 20, 28 and 29 that uh, they even cried and they cut themselves. You know, they, they cut their, their, their skins and the, and the blood would, would, would ooze from those cuts in order that Baal may hear them. But then we are told that there was no answer. There was no answer. Ahab had led the nation into idolatry in a greater degree. He did all such kind of things and the, the people followed. He, 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 he married a heathen princess. He brought in the, the, the worship of idols. And the nation followed. Very sad. But uh, as, uh, as true worshippers of God, we, we need to remain worshippers of the true God of heaven. When we read from Ex Exodus chapter 23 verse 2, it says that we, we are not supposed to follow a crowd or a multitude or the majority to do evil. Even when you are alone amongst thousands of Adventists who may choose to do wrong things, it's better that you, you remain loyal, even alone. Our problem as human beings is that we tend to follow the, the, the majority. Even in things that are not right, we say, oh, because the, oh, the, the church has, has done this, oh, then we follow. No. Elijah was there facing 850 prophets of idols. And he was, al was alone on Mount Carmel. The people should have, the, the, the nation should have rejected the, the, those strange theories brought in by Ahab. They should have not given in to such, but then they followed. And so, we are not better than the Israelites. We should understand that we are not better than the Israelites. Um, I'm reading from um, a quote that is in Christian Service, page 41, that says, It is a solemn statement that I make to the church, that not one in 20 whose names are registered upon the church books are prepared to close their earthly history and would be as verily without God and without hope in the world as the common sinner. They are professedly saving God, but they are more earnestly saving mammon. This half and half work is a constant denying of Christ rather than a confessing of Christ. So many have brought into the church their own unsubdued spirit, unrefined spirit, in heart, and unrefined. Their spiritual taste is perverted by their own immoral debasing corruptions symbolizing the world in spirit, in heart, in purpose, conforming themselves in lustful practices and are full of deception through and through in their professed Christian life, living as sinners claiming to be Christians. Those who claim to be Christians and who confess Christ should come out from among them and detach not the unclean thing and be separate. Just like we read from 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 17 to 18. 
We are called upon to separate ourselves from the world. And so, now, I know there's, there's a sister in the church this morning who has been faltering in between two opinions and have not fully decided to live for Christ in every aspect. There's a brother in the church this morning who has continued to falter in between two opinions. He has not yet fully decided to follow everything that the church teaches. There's someone in our midst who has spent so many years in the church and yet he has kept on faltering in between two opinions. But then today, God says we need to become fully decided for him. Is it your desire to follow Christ in every aspect of your life? We are told from verses 30 to 32. Verses 30 to 32. That Elijah repaired the altar. I would read this one. Chapter 18, the very chapter 18, verses 30 to 32. Then Elijah said to all the people, come near to me. So all the people came near to him. And he repaired the altar of the Lord that was broken down. And Elijah took twelve stones, according to the number of the tribes of the sons of Jacob, to whom the word of the Lord had come, saying, Israel shall be your name. Then with the stones he built an altar in the name of the Lord, and he made a trench around the altar large enough to hold two seers of seed. Elijah said, come unto me. And he repaired the altar. It was very, it's, it's a very disgraceful, you know, uh, scene to look at. To find the altar of the Lord on, on Mount Camel, having broken down without being repaired. It means it was not being used. It was, it was it, the people had stopped using it for the worship of the true God of heaven. Instead, they built a different altar for Baal. And so he repaired the altar. And he took 12 stones according to the number of the tribes of Israel and, and made an altar to God. So, the, the altar in the church is supposed to be repaired. During these last days, according to the spirit of prophecy, the spirit of Elijah is, is, is expected by God to be seen in his church. And so, we need to have the altar of the Lord in the church to be repaired. But then the thing is, the altar in the church cannot be repaired when the altars in our various homes and our respective homes are not in order. The, the small altars that are found in our homes need to be repaired. In a lot of Adventist homes, the altars for the Lord are broken down. There is no altar for worship, for prayer time in the homes. A people, in, instead of living as the light to the world, to those surrounding them, they just li like living like the heathen. And so we need to, to repair the various altars in our homes. In the manner of entertainment or amusement that we seek, that we go for, does it contribute to, to, to altars that, have been, that, that, that are sustained for the worship of God? In the manner of diet, the kind of diet that we pursue, is it according to the guidelines of God? Or do we just want, are we, are we just blown away? Do we go by the world? Do we go by the diet that the world pursues? We've got a special message in this world. But do we desire to follow it? In our manner of dress, 
It should be that kind of dress that should be blameless and that gives honor to God, that gives glory to God. Not, not behaving like the heathen. And so our general behavior should be that that should reflect a full purpose of heart. When we live like that, then our faith would be reflected wherever we go. But it is sad to find that in the church, some people, their godliness is only when they are church. When they are in the church or, surround, or uh, around uh, the church surrounding, they, they reflect that Adventism. When they are away from church, godliness is gone. Like that, we cannot be able to repair the altar of the Lord in the church. But we need to sustain, we need to maintain godliness wherever we are. When we do so, when we repair our home altars, then we would be able to have a clear understanding of our mission and purpose. As Adventists, a lot of us do not reflect the knowledge of the, of the stage at which this earth has reached. Our lives do not reflect us such kind of a condition. And so, when we search ourselves and we make corrections in life, and we humble ourselves before God and ask him to give us the wisdom on how to live in this world, then we would be able to have a clear understanding of our mission and purpose. And so, by so doing, we would be able to, to contribute to the spreading of the three angels' messages. And so we would be able to be evangelistic as a church. And then there will be revival and reformation in the church. And the world would have a clear knowledge of God's commandments. You know, I have had been told by, the, the, by Elijah, the prophet, that it is you who has forsaken the commandments of the Lord. So, you know, there is this kind of um, uh, fashion, manner of godliness in the church. People do not want to maintain the former godliness of old, that, that Adventism, uh, with the principles upon which Adventism were built on. We try to dilute our principles, and so that's dangerous. But then, when we turn to God fully, the world would know would have a true knowledge of the, of the commandments of God. When we do so, then we would do away with the strange doctrines that some people bring into the church. We would maintain the right doctrine for Christ in the SDA church. So away with strange doctrines in the church of the Lord. And so, by so doing, there would be a distinction between God's church and the nominal churches. You know, Elijah was able to say, I alone am the one remaining as a true worshiper of God. As a church, we need to tell the world that we are the remnant church in this world. But there's that, that kind of reasoning, you know, even before the non-Adventists, oh, oh, you know, we are, we are just the same. <laughs> oh, we are Adventists, we are just, no, we need to tell them, oh, our church is the remnant church in this world, and then we give them pieces of scripture to prove it. So we need to make sure there's that kind of distinction that the world should know between the church of the living God and the nominal churches. According to Isaiah chapter 2, verses 2 and 3. Isaiah chapter 2, verses 2 and 3. This is my last text. I know. Isaiah chapter 2, verses 2 and 3. Mount Carmel was, was a symbol, is, is another symbol of church, of a church. And in this regard, a symbol 
of the church of God. Isaiah chapter 2 verses 2 and 3 says, Now it shall come to pass in the latter days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established on the top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills and all nations shall flow to it. Many people shall come and say, Come and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord to the house of the God of Jacob. He will teach us his ways, and we shall walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall come forth the law, and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. This was prophecy. This is prophetic. This message is prophetic for the Lord's church in the last days. A mountain is a symbol of a church. And so God says that in the last days, the, the people should, you, uh, are, are supposed to flock to the, mount, to the mountain of the Lord, which is the Lord's church in the last days. People need to have a clear understanding, a clear distinction between the true, the true church of Christ on this planet and the nominal churches. So that people would fully decide wisely, would be, would, would be able to reason wisely in order for them to come to the church of the living God. Then the, uh, the, the people who are in the, in, uh, in the mountain already, in the church already, are the ones who are supposed to, to declare to the world that they are the ones who are in the very church of the living God, in the true church. And so is it your desire is it your desire to proclaim this message to the world? Is it your desire to see to it that a strange manner of worship is banished from the church of the Lord? Is it your desire to do away with the human manner of reasoning in the church so that only godly principles are followed? Is it your desire to see to it that the altar of the Lord in the church is maintained in good shape? Because God wants to see Elijah's in the church today. When we read from Patriarchs and Prophets, Pages 140 to 141, we find a message that God wants to see the spirit of Elijah in the church. Not that kind of spirit of conformity, the kind of spirit of, 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 of trying to, to suit worldly kind of reasoning. No. The spirit of Elijah is that that cuts the message straight, that tells the world a clear and straightforward message as it comes from all the way uh, from all, the, all the way from the throne of God in heaven. So is it your desire that God should account you worthy to proclaim this gospel just like he had chosen Elijah to do so? To bring a reformation in the church. Even though we keep on, or we keep on praying for the latter rain. Yes, we do well because we need it. But then, without, without earnest, earnest reformation to ourselves, that kind of latter rain will never come. So we need to seek God earnestly to see to it that uh, we follow everything according to, it, to his command. Is it your desire this morning to become fully decided for Christ? May the Lord guide us in his word.